so we've got three preachers today that, have, that are speaking today, not all in each service, but one preacher per service. Miss Kim Snow preached in the first service, in the 830 service. She killed it, did a great job, brought the word. And, and this service, we got uh, this one. Uh, I'm excited for all three of the, guy, uh, the folks that are preaching this morning. But I want to tell you, I, I want to say thank you for allowing us to be a house that develops. Now, I will also be honest with you and tell you that as a, as a preacher, I have not always been good at this. And I'll tell you why. Is I really, really like to preach. I like it a lot, a lot. And so it was hard for me to turn that over. And I grew up in a developer's church. My dad was, I think he told me in the first service, there were 21 different pastors, ministers, people that come out of his ministry into other churches or ministries or, or pastoring or whatever they're doing. And, and I'm realizing as I'm getting older, say amen, church, <laughs> that there is a joy in pushing people forward that I didn't know. And, and I'm experiencing it now. Like today, I just feel like proud dad with our, our young preachers. And we've got several. We've got, you know, Aaron that preaches. here's on staff with us here. It gets better every time he preaches. Reed Parker that preaches. Like I, he's not preaching today. And somebody was like, why isn't Reed preaching? I'm like, because once we get Reed going, he, it's hard to get him to stop. <laughs> and uh, because he, once Reed gets in a place where ministry is his thing, he's going to do it for the rest of his life. It's, uh, and so like God has, God has made us this church and he has allowed us to be this church. So thank you first and foremost for allowing us to be this church. Uh, because I think healthy churches win people, healthy churches train people, and healthy churches send people. And we want to be a church that does all three of those things. I read this statistic, and I'm gonna, I promise I'm going to let Zach come out here in just a second. I read this statistic a few weeks back, or it's been a couple months back now, that the average age of preachers... 20 years ago was 44 years old in America. That was the average age of pastors in America. You're like, yeah, that sounds about right. Recently, they've done the study again, and the average age of pastors is 54 years old. So if you're any good at math at all, you can realize what's happening is that young people aren't stepping into the call to keep the average low. In other words, our pastors are getting older and older and older, and people aren't, they're not accepting the call to step in the gap. And so for us to be able to have a Young Preachers Weekend is incredible to me. It, it means we, as Real Life Church, we're doing our part to win them, train them, and ultimately send them to pastor churches and lead ministries and do those kind of things, because that's my heart. That's, what, that's who we're going to be. And so, so I want to say thank you for that. This morning, you guys get a special treat, Zach. Um, Zach Osterhus. I've called him Osterhaus. I've called him Ahasem Pfeffer. I've called him all of those things, haven't I? It's just Zach O. But Zach, a few months back, I was teaching a What is the Bible next track class. And Zach and his wife Taylor were sitting right here, and I started talking about the call of God. And Taylor, like a good preacher's wife, was giving Zach the business. She just elbowing him, and finally I'm like, what? And Zach came to me afterwards and talked to me. He's like, I just feel like God's been calling me into this, and I don't really know what to do. And so I think counting today, this will be the third time Zach has spoke in front of any group of people. Um, the two times he did it before were just in front of our staff or a few of our staff. And so this morning, I want you guys to do me a favor. I want you to encourage. I want you to pray for. I want you to lift up. But I want you to listen because I believe that these individuals are called. And if they're called, it means that God has given them a word. And if God has given them a word, it's worth you hearing. Okay? So if you guys would do me the honor of showing Zach O some honor this morning as he comes and preaches the word. Good morning, everyone. Well, he already brought up the last name, so I don't have to put that one out there for everyone. Uh, my name's Zach, obviously, and 
I just wanted to start off by giving thanks to the church and to Pastor Vince for allowing me to have the opportunity to be here today. Uh, some of you guys might know me, some of you might not know me. Uh, you might see me in the mornings and I'm that guy with the crazy beard that says good morning over and over and over again to you guys. Um, some of you might not know me at all, so today before we get into this, I kind of wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Zach Osterhus, and I have an amazing wife. She's right here in the front seat, and she did that because she wanted to make me more nervous than I already am. I got an amazing dog, and we just recently got married last year, and we just bought our first house together. And so, if you can imagine... Uh, this last week after buying that house has been a wreck because there's been a lot of paint, trim, all kinds of stuff flying everywhere. It's been fun. Uh, something about me, I love doing outdoor stuff. I love working with my hands. That's kind of what I feel like God has put in my life, that I have the ability to work with my hands really well. Uh, I love doing handyman style stuff. That's kind of where I feel comfortable. I love, you know, building things. If, if you want me to build a deck for you or something like that, though, I won't do it because it's not because I can't do it. It's because I don't want to do it. Um, I, I love the outdoors, and I love going backpacking, camping, and hiking with friends and family. Uh, that's something that really makes me feel comfortable because I get to spend time in God's creation, and it just makes me feel closer to him. Something I'm not comfortable doing is uh, speaking, if you can't tell already. <laughs> this is something that gets me outside of my comfort zone, but if I'm going to do it, I'm happy that I'm doing it here to glorify God. So that makes me happy. Today, before we get into the scripture that I'm going to be going over, one thing that I would like to do, because it is my first time, I would like to have everybody bow their heads with me for just a second so I could say a prayer. God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for calling me into the place that you've placed me today. I pray you give me peace and understanding and wisdom, and that you open the hearts and the minds of those that are in the crowd today, that they might receive something that you have in store for them. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody would want to turn to it, we're going to be in 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 12 today. Um, and I'm going to be in the ESV version. So if you have another version, it should be pretty similar. But uh, before we start reading, I want to give you guys a little bit of a backstory of kind of what's going on in 1 Timothy and what's happening here. So 1 Timothy is basically Apostle Paul is... He's, send, he's writing a letter to Timothy, and Timothy looks to Apostle Paul as kind of a mentor or a father figure, you know, leading him. And Paul is charging Timothy in these letters to go to this church and, well, to teach this church in Ephesus better theology than they've been teaching and teach them the right stuff, the right doctrine, teach them to pray again because they've been messing up the law, and they've been messing up these things and teaching weird theology, and he's trying to get them away from that. So Paul's sending Timothy this letter, and Timothy in this time, he's roughly around the age of 30 to 38-ish is where the theologists say he's at. So he's kind of young, but not really. I guess it just depends on, you know, your guys' opinion on that. But I just turned 24, if you don't know me, and we can all know that at 24, if you guys remember, 24 is a rough time in your life because you're kind of like halfway an adult, but not really. Like, you still kind of do things on your own because you're figuring it out, but you're also calling your parents on the weekend saying, hey, I need help. So you're not really an adult yet, but you're kind of there. <laughs> so pray for me, please. So in verse 6 of 1 Timothy 4, it says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. 
Command and teach these things and let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and in conduct and love and faith and in purity. Today I'm going to be focusing on verse 8 of that. And verse 8 goes over how bodily training has some value, but godliness is of value in every way because it holds a promise for this life and the life to come. And I'm going to give everyone three points today going over that scripture. And my first point that I want to give everyone today is going to be, be aware of your misplaced value. As humans, we love finding ourselves placing or manufacturing value in different things. Depending on our feelings, we can increase the value of something or we can decrease the value of something. Often we place our value in physical things. Maybe we increase or decrease the value of how we feel depending on our weight or how big we are or how small we are. We, de- we place value on the opinions that people have about how much hair we have or less hair we have. Or maybe it's material things, like some of us place value in the things that we have, like our homes, if our home's too small or too big. Or maybe it's a vehicle we drive is not nice enough or it's too nice. We place value in these things, and sometimes it's even placed in, like, the phone brands we use. We know that iPhone people feel more valuable than the rest of us all the time. I mean, (laughs) that's just a fact. Maybe. (laughs) But sometimes we love flip-flopping our value. Sometimes we find that value is teeter-tottered. We like to place value in one thing over another. Some of us place more value in where our vape's at in the morning than we place it in where our Bible is. Some of us place more value in our phone and spending time on social media than we do spending time with our kids. And when we do that, that can mess up a lot of things in our lives. I personally, I place my value in something, and it might not be that serious to some people, but to me, at the time, it was very serious. I place my value in a a truck. And right here on the screen is going to be a picture of it. This thing right here, This, if you don't know, is a 2019 Toyota Tacoma. This is the epitome of a man's truck. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe some. So this truck right here, I spent way too much time, way too much money, dressing this bad boy up. I didn't do anything to the motor, anything to the differential, to the transmission, nothing. I didn't re-gear it, nothing, like I should have. I spent my time focusing on making it look like that. And the reason why is because I wanted every one of you to break your necks looking at it when you drove by. (laughs) I placed my value in it. I placed my value in this truck. I placed my value in the acknowledgement I got from everyone else when they said, oh, this thing's awesome. I had moments where I would... I would crave driving up to like Home Depot or something and I could have the worst day and I'd drive up to Home Depot and I'd just be, oh, I'm just, this is the worst day ever. I just can't stand it. Somebody would walk up and say, man, you have the coolest truck I've ever seen. Bing! (laughs) Happiest day ever. Of course, that was me feeling that the value I'd placed on it had increased the value of me in those moments. But just like that, when I would go to an event, because I took this thing to events, there'd be a lot cooler vehicles out there. And as soon as I'd see one of those, my value would just whoom, right to the floor. Because man, this ain't that, this ain't awesome compared to some of those vehicles out there. This is nothing. Just like this truck has now been sold, and I don't have this truck anymore, so you won't see me driving it through the parking lot, so you can't find me after church. Just like it's been gone now, just like the attention that we get from people goes to someone else or to something else, and just like our age gets older, no matter who you are, just like this truck, it's all temporary. It's all fleeting. It's all going to go away. And if your value's found in this temporary thing, 
When it leaves, so does your value. But my second point for you guys today is let me tell you guys something about something that has eternal value. My second point is what has eternal value? Well, Paul says it specifically in verse 8. He says that there is, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds a promise for the present life and also the life to come. But what is godliness and why would we have value in it? Well, godliness, right off the bat, it has value because godliness is described as showing reverence and respect to Christ or to God. We find value in it when we understand the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us. Because when he made the, the sacrifice on the cross for us and he took on our sin and shame, that gives us understanding and value in that sacrifice, which makes us ultimately want to show him respect and reverence in the things that we do. Let me give you guys an example. I think we can all remember what it was like being in our teenage years, right? I mean, does anybody else remember that? I, I, I specifically do because it wasn't like that far away. <laughs> being a teenager, you have this, this whole thing going on where you're right all the time. Doesn't matter what your parents say, doesn't matter what anyone else says, you are all the time doing what you want because that's all that matters. Your parents, everything that they've done for you, you can smear their name all over the floor because it doesn't matter because at the time, you don't really have that respect. Now, some of you did, and if you did, good job, but me personally, I didn't always respect my parents the way I should have. It took me going through the things I had to go through, growing up and having to go through the things they did till I was able to understand the sacrifices they made each and every day so that I could have the life that I'm living now. Now, because I understand the sacrifices that they made, where I got stuff when they didn't, or they spent late days working and working and working and having overtime hours, and then I got to come home and relax, because of that sacrifice, I now am able to respect them for it. So just like their sacrifice, Christ made the ultimate sacrifice when he died on the cross for us, and because of that, we deserve no, he deserves nothing more than us showing our reverence and respect to him daily. How do you find that eternal value, though? Maybe this is your first time here today. Maybe you haven't, you don't know too much about Christ, and you don't know too much about the sacrifice that he's made for you. How do you find out about that sacrifice? Well, you read the Bible. Borrow someone's Bible. Go in and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how Jesus lived his life and how he took on our sin and shame on the cross and how his blood on Calvary was shed for you and me when we didn't deserve it. Paul says in verse 7, Have nothing to do with irreverent or silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. I feel like if Paul said it, it's probably pretty important, so that's where I want to make my third point for everyone today, is train in godliness. We know it has eternal value, but we have to train it each day. Paul tells us how to do this in verses 11 through 12 of 1 Timothy 4. He says, Command and teach these things, and let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, and in purity. He lays out a perfect map for us to do that. He says to train in speech, to train in conduct, to train in love, faith, and purity. In our conduct and in our speech, how do we speak to others throughout the day? How do we use our language and what language do we use? When we show respect and reverence in those things to God, we're using the right language and the right way we speak to people. How do we conduct ourselves? We train in godliness by conducting ourselves like Christ would have. Not only in public, but conducting ourselves properly in private when no one's around. We show godliness and training in godliness in how we love someone when we go through moments where there might be hate in our heart, but we forgive and love someone because that's what Christ did for us. Not only that, but then faith. When tragedy strikes, how do we train in godliness in that? By showing faith when the only thing we have to lean on when tragedy strikes is Christ. 
and in purity in the way that we think and the thoughts that we have. We train in godliness in those things. The main idea is work on your life, being an example, living a life like Christ will train you in godliness. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, if anyone wants to take that down as a note, in 2 Peter 1, he, he speaks about other things as well as godliness and why it's important. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self control, and self control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, you keep from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says that in these moments, that if godliness is an increasing attribute in our lives, that we get to be effective and fruitful, and it keeps us from being ineffective and unfruitful in these moments. And I think if we can all agree that if God's calling us in, in life and he's leading us to do something or to be more than we are now, that we want to be fruitful and we want to be effective, and that means training in godliness. As I close today and walk through where we've been, we've seen where we misplace our value, and we've seen where our value can be found, where eternal value can be found, and godliness and the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us. we also seen how to train in godliness. But when we accept that free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ gives us, we know the value in godliness. And a lot of times I think that we miss those moments where godliness is something that we can train on in our lives. We place our value in other people's opinions. We place our value in, their, in, in what people think of us instead of living a life that's showing respect and reverence to God. The priceless value that Christ gave us when he sacrificed his life on the cross for us deserves nothing but respect and reverence each day in everything that we do. And that's something we have to practice at and practice at and practice at because no one's perfect. And I think God knows that and that's why we have to train in it. We have to train in godliness each day because we have the opportunity now to praise and to worship him and lead a life worthy of his sacrifice because of how he's blessed us when none of us here are deserved it and we're all sinners and we all fall short. Would everyone bow their heads with me for a moment? If today you feel like you've been holding on to this thing that you've placed value in and you just, you just don't know what to do with it and you've missed out on the value that could be found in Jesus, or maybe it's too hard to let go of some of the things in your life you've been holding on to because you feel like it's valuable and you don't want to let go of it because it leaves you feeling empty. You don't have to feel empty and alone and searching for value anymore. You can find value in Jesus and the value in godliness today. You can take that step. We have the opportunity, there's altars available, and people would love to come pray with you and walk with you through letting go of some of this misplaced value. And if this is something you need to do, come up here and let it out. Let it go of this misplaced value in your life today and give up some of these things that you've been holding on to and accept the value that's found in Jesus. If you're having a hard time letting go and moving and you feel like your values and things that are fleeting and won't last and you'd like to place your trust in Christ today but you just don't know where to start, would you put your hand up for me and write back down so I can pray for you? God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the time that you've given us. We pray that you've opened some hearts and some minds to what you have in store for us, that you lead us to get rid of some of this misplaced value in our lives, that you guide us to 
find and understand the value that is found through Jesus Christ, your sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, be with all of those that are here today on their way homes and throughout this week that maybe something that they heard today impacts their life or maybe impacts the lives of those around them. We thank you for giving us the ability to find value in your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.